hello everybody, I'm Stefano and I am a machine learning engineer in Trustpilot. So tonight I uh, will uh, briefly show you how uh, what we're doing in Trustpilot with machine learning and how we implemented some MLOps practices within our ML framework. And I'll share with you some lessons that we learned so far during this journey. Uh, so just to give you a brief outline, I'll, I will first explain what Trustpilot is what we do, why we're using ML, and then uh, down to the journey, how we introduce MLOps within our ML, how we interact with data scientists, what we got from there, as well as a word story, because nothing is perfect, just keep in mind nothing. And then there are some conclusions, obviously, to summarize everything. So what's Trustpilot? Uh, maybe many of you already know, but it's better to say Trustpilot as a company, it's a European company, Founded in 2007, as a vision is to become a global symbol of trust. You may know the Trustpilot website. Uh, on this website, you can look for companies, and each company has a set of reviews. Uh, each review has a star evaluation as well from one to five. And then on top, you can see what it was a trust score. So, uh, how good, how trust is your company? Trustpilot is widely present. As you can see, there are a lot of languages that try to enlist through the flags. Um, and what we do is actually a twofold mission. On one side, we are helping people, and the other side, we're helping businesses. So helping people means that we are uh, being an honest destination for consumers to have clear reviews and also direct communication with businesses. And on the other side, we're helping businesses in getting value out of the reviews to understand what the consumers are saying and uh, so how they're performing. In numbers, Trustpilot has uh, 900 employees all over the world. Uh, we count uh, more than 190 million reviews, and we're receiving about 4 million reviews every month. So as you can see, under 90 million reviews, to me, looks like a huge amount of data. And so there's no surprise that uh, we do need help from machine learning to get out some value out of it. Uh, for this reason, in Trustpilot, we have three uh, data science team. Um, the first one is trust. Uh, trust, um, the major focus of trust is to protect the Trustpilot platform from, for example, scam and spam or fraud, fraud fraudulent reviews. So, Major focus will be developing this kind of models. Product and insights uh, deals a lot with the reviews and try to extract value out of the review to give value to businesses. So for example, sentiment analysis or topic modeling. And at the same time, helps consumers to have a, a better enjoyable experience on our website. And then commercial growth, uh, as the name suggests, uh, they're looking for new opportunities, new businesses, uh, detecting churn of possible businesses. So given this uh, mindset and this ML framework, um, how everything started. So um, I would say that three years ago, uh, there weren't a real uh, ML engineering team in Trustpilot. Uh, people were developing their model, but I could say it was very hard to get to production. Then we started to form this team and at first, we wonder, okay, what can we go? What can we do? What, where can we go? And uh, who can help us? So there are tons of resources online. I try to summarize them to the most important one for me, which is comes from Microsoft. Uh, here and uh, on this website, they are listing uh, five levels of MLOps maturity within your company. And I think they're very useful to help your company to understand what path to take, how to interact to be more MLOps compliant. So when we started, and I think everyone, when it started, there's no shame, it's level zero, level one. Level zero means that you don't have uh, any MLOps infrastructure, MLOps also philosophy uh, in your way of working. You might have DevOps because DevOps uh, are present everywhere now, nowadays, but we know that a machine learning model behaves quite differently from a software. So we do need to follow some MLOps uh, things uh, most of the cases, you might have a single engineer which is devoted to take a model and try to productionize it somehow, maybe in a convoluted way. Uh, so it's quite hard to get to production. 
During these three years, we work uh, mainly on level two and level three, uh, which are automated training and automated deployment. So, and there's a huge amount of work to do to have a smooth training interface. Uh, basically, the outcome to have uh, the, the check if you're level two or level three is if you're doing a track on your training and you have a low friction in deploying. Uh, I think we're still working a lot on deploying and uh, lower down this friction. I think that it's never ending work here. And finally, level four is where we'd like to be full automated, but as a snow laugh is so complicated, monitoring place requires a lot, a lot of work because it's not only monitoring your model, but you have to monitor all your infrastructure. So given this path, we start interviewing our data scientists and trying to understand what they really want uh, so we knew we were going to develop an ML platform. And so we asked them, so what are your requirements for an ML platform to host your model? So, well, no surprise, user-friendly platform. Ideally, there should be a button to say deploy. Uh, there will be someday, I'm sure. Uh, the important thing is that the platform must be flexible. And this is something I'd, I'd like to stress a little bit because we are used to data scientists coding up in Python, but in a company, you may have also people who are coding up in SQL and they like to see SQL query running in real time against some data, for example. So, you, and other cases like R or whatever. So you need to be, to integrate all these, all these requirements and have the platform be flexible enough to support all the business cases that you have. And obviously the platform should be easily integrated within your system, don't disrupt any of your current APIs or uh, tools that you have, keep them in place and just work around and have some monitoring tools to understand immediately if there are problems or not. And the second question was, uh, okay, so what are the pain points that you're experiencing? So uh, level zero, no deployment, and there we go. Model deployment was one of the key points. So how do I deploy my model? I'm very good, I got a fantastic MacBook, I developed my model, but I can deploy it. Uh, so that was uh, the first major hurdle to solve. And then I think a common problem across companies, especially if companies are scaling up, is data. You have data everywhere, maybe on AWS, then on GCP, and then on something somewhere else. So data scientists asked for a way to retrieve data easily. And I think the requirement was, please create a feature store so we can have also features already done. And finally, third problem was uh, slow model prototyping. So um, I think as uh, Sway said, uh, well, before uh, test and test, but be, be quite fast in testing, please. Uh, here, there were a lot of scripts, a lot of scripts to retrieve data, a lot of scripts to retrieve also metrics and plots generated throughout the, the entire process. So is it possible to be fast? Um, and so, so yeah, this is the major focus of the presentation. After almost three years, I think that uh, we ingested everything and we can say we learned at least three lessons. Uh, first of all, um, if you want to start MLOps, uh, please ask to your stakeholders what are the highest pain points and try to solve them as first thing, first priority. From here, you can get a lot of benefits, a lot of value out of your team immediately in a nutshell. The second thing is simplify your final product. I think, I don't know, here we might have a lot of engineers. We are very good in coding up, but I think sometimes we are creating very complicated SDKs and then you give them to data scientists and they say, okay, now what should I do? So try to simplify as much as you can your product. So we try to reduce the amount of information to give, for example, to the SDKs we're creating. So just an import statement and uh, a line of code to add to your existing code and then you're free to run using uh, some MLOps services, for example. And uh, it's very painful, but keep updating your documentation and run tutorials across the teams. So uh, from time to time, I guess the products are updated. And so you must keep everyone updated to what are the new latest things that you introduced. And final things I was saying before, flexibility, remember to think after the box, don't stay focused on a single technology and multiple technologies. If I want to use R, please let me use R. If I want to use Python, I'll use Python. And if I want to use SQL, SQL, whatever. So multiple solution, uh, don't stick to a single one. I promised Mike to give us a little, a wee concrete example of what he's talking after three years. 
So this is how uh, one of our MLOps solution work nowadays. So what we have is a uh, data scientist has built up his model and is now in an image, perfect. What we are basing all our, uh, some, some of our trainings, is on the GCP, in particular on a technology called Vertex AI, which can run Kubeflow pipelines. And it's very powerful, a lot of really promising. So what we've done to simplify all the chaotic things to do is to wrap everything in a SDK where data scientists could import all the components they need to make up their own pipeline for training and deployment. And for example, here, data scientists could read data from a database like BigQuery, you could run model training, check if the model performance is all right, and deploy the model. And uh, they should just uh, commit this to GitHub. There's obviously a CI/CD process in place. And uh, here we are building and deploying and staging and production. And under GCP, what the data centers will immediately have is a pipeline, which can uh, automatically be attached to a cloud scheduler. So if you need your model to run every day, this will run every day or every hour or whatever. This can be easily be trained. And uh, the Vertex AI uh, SDK will allow you to interact with our offline feature store as well as other services and track your training through an uh, MLflow architecture with that. If the model is fine, fantastic. It can go through deployment. And so it could be deployed to uh, an endpoint or through some uh, different way, like using Dataflow, which is another uh, great GCP product. As you can see, we try to compact everything easily, as well as MLflow comes to a very simple SDK where data center has to write, just simply start training, start tracking training, and it does all the rest. They don't have to care about input leave or any other messy things. Um, and yeah, so perfect, fantastic, all brilliant. Wow, uh, no. So uh, I'd say, I'd say MLOps, uh, has brought really a uh, huge benefit to our data scientists, really. Uh, if I check, for example, the trust team uh, for scam spam detection, we had a massive benefit because scam attempts uh, just uh, were lowered down by nine times compared to previous years. So quite good and less stress for our agents to check, inspect reviews or uh, listen to whistleblowers and so on. But all through this journey, we'll learn also something else, which is do not rush for deployment. So uh, you might be very excited with this MLOps hype. You might have found a good way to deploy your model easily and quickly. But remember, I think sometimes we need to be very formal and put up everything on a list and double check all the requirements for deploying your model. Uh, models have tons of parameters, and sometimes there are tiny, tiny parameters which you say copy and paste, and it will be fine. That's what we did, but we didn't consider some, some problems in just copying paste. So like in this case, for a week, we missed thousands of scammers on our platform. So they were free to scam as well done. Uh, so, well, this is just to say MLOps fantastic. Um, all great, can give a lot of benefits, but I mean, uh, not everything is perfect. No one is perfect. I think even Apple and Meta are not perfect. They might have this kind of accent as you can see on WhatsApp. So mm -hmm. definitely, definitely uh, double check always and be careful on what's going on. And yes, so to summarize, uh, three years, three lessons learned, uh, get to know your team, interview your team, trying to understand what they want, what are their pain points and try to help them immediately. Communicate, always keep them up to date, always communicate clearly, write down a lot, documentation, etc., and simplify things, but don't rebuild everything from scratch. So if there's already a tool, an SDK, whatever, please use it, it's already done. You may simplify it. And finally, remember to think always outside the box. So there are multiple solutions, tons of different paths that you can take to bring these things to deployment. So without rushing, you may have excellent, excellent results. And that's it. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you very much. I've got some time for questions. Yeah. I have one like, basic question. So we've talked quite a lot about there's all these different artifacts of, of making your model work. And 
NL and then it's, it's sort of cousin NL ops. It's not exactly a binary operation of whether it's working or not working. Yeah. And then it's sort of buggy or squiggly around it. So at what point in time do you, your team, trust pilot, your boss, whoever, think, okay, this is good enough. We can make this happen. Uh, what gives you a sense of happening this? Oh, good, good, good question. I think, I think we realize when uh, there's been a lot of test and try. For example, we started with very simple rules and used some streaming to detect spam and scan, for example. And as we were learning so far how to do all, to deal with all these uh, tools, at some point we say, "Gosh, it's so easy to bring models to deployment with." Uh, a few simple Python codes, Python lines. Okay, that's that's something really remarkable. And actually, now you're making me think, I think we realized, uh, I would say just a month ago, maybe. <laughs> like, no, well, I, I personally realized it because uh, when I saw data scientists uh, productionizing another new model without hustle and bringing our infrastructure and use it as most of they could with uh, lots of uh, scheduling as well as uh, uh, more than one daily retraining for a specific model and so on. I say, haha, that's not bad, that's not bad. Um, on both sides, I think there was a good push. Uh, people know they were confining people working on laptops only. And uh, as soon as they saw that we were creating something valuable, uh, there was an immediate push to say, okay, let's, let's go in this direction. This seems promising, given also the costs. That is always good to check. That was another couple of questions. Maybe big bang first and then another one. Right. So you mentioned yeah. data scientists as stakeholders. I imagine the model endpoints will also have downstream consumers, will have requirements, and if they want SLOs around 395 levels and things. And do you find yourself in the middle mediating between data scientists wanting the latest big models versus what downstream consumers need in terms of? Um, well, that depends uh, Depends on the kind of uh, business case you're dealing with. Um, there are pro projects where I was in between and understanding what data scientists want as well as the downstream consumers want. Uh, most of the time, I must confess that data scientists are doing a brilliant job with downstream consumers. Uh, they are liaising with them and creating like some also a doc solution to then give them exactly what they want. Uh, so I think there's a good balance between us and data scientists to deal with them. I think there was the first question at the back. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I've got a very basic question um, as a DevOps engineer, because I'm trying to get my head around what differences between DevOps and DevOps in the ML world and MLOps, because <laughs> your description of it, so my view, not the way I think of the DevOps is you know, you're, you're deploying the software out into the field and you might be doing it all at once to Big Bang or you might be doing Canary where you, you gradually expand or whatever. But there's a bit where you go, is it working? And the bit I don't yet get is what's the difference between that and just mm -hmm. doing ML ops where the is it working bit, the ML bit? Yeah. Is there as, a as, as, okay, so I can do some ad for us. <laughs> Adam Stoke, he tried to reply to this question um, last month. Not two okay. months ago, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Actually, I, I think DevOps is really uh, regulated on a on a cycle, and and you know you're uh, building, testing, and deploying, and so on. MLOps, I uh, fail sometimes. It's just test and try, see what's happening. It works fine. Mm -hmm. um, there's no more. I think a neat division between a staging environment and a production environment as well. So sometimes you'd really like to see what's happening in production without messing up with the production environment. Uh, so you can't keep them so secluded each other. They should communicate. Um, yeah, these are my two major things, but there are tons of difference. Uh, well, we can we can discuss about it later with the beer because <laughs> it's not so easy. More questions? I think you're first here. I think you were first, Steve. Okay. Um, 
mine I guess better than bigger with each one. Obviously, when an alot side of things is a lot newer than the data science side of things. So how do you find managing like the differences between the MLOP priorities and integrating that into the data science way of things? So like I don't know, as an example, um data science often not so everyone does it we think locally, um they don't necessarily have CI pipeline or code quality checks, whereas for them a lot we maybe want to do those things, but it might yes. be seen as a chore or tech debt. How how do you balance those things? I'm relieved to hear this question. And because uh, we had some clashes indeed with data scientists, because when you're bringing a new technology, uh, you may have two cases. The new technologies uh, might be good. My, may, you may face the innovator's dilemma. So no one is going to use it. Uh, otherwise, the technology is too complicated to be used. So how do we manage uh, a lot of uh, tutorials, a lot of discussions, a lot of uh, meetings uh, to find the right compromise between their request and our request. Um, if I think initially like this workflow has to take a lot of work, a lot of months to be uh, pushed to production because uh, missing communication on our side, first of all, and also missing a clear uh, requirements from data scientists, for example. So we, we had to talk a lot and start to be really one single team all together uh, sometimes there are, you know, there's machine learning, ML engineers team and data scientists divided one. They should be more uh, all together, mixed up, communicate and understand exactly what's going on. Okay. Yeah, there are some more. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get it. <laughs> I have two questions if I may. Uh, so the first one is in relation to your war story. You mentioned that because the uh, because the, the parameters were wrong, the scam attempts went up. Huh? If you're relying on the model to detect the scam attempts, how did you know they went up? I I, I just know because uh, the models was built in a uh, let's say it has a it has a flag to be checked the same in order to have the model to be fully working. Uh, what we do um we, we can monitor models and see the performance. And if the performance is like in an hour, they're filtering less than X users, for example, we have an alert and we can immediately realize mm, there's something going on with the model. And from that, we can do a retrospective and understand what's what's going wrong. Okay. So that's that's how we got it. Cool, thank you. Uh, a second question, perhaps more basic. Uh, what is a feature store? Like oh. I've heard this term recently and I'm, I still don't quite get it. My fault, I should explain. A uh, feature store at like a database with uh, already pre pre ready features for data scientists to be used. A feature can be, for example, Trustpilot may have the review, and most of the time, as a data scientist, you might extract the length of this review. That's how, how many numbers of characters, how many how many words used, right? The feature store uh, provides you already this feature. Uh, done so without you to have coding up the code for uh, reading the review and extracting the number of characters or whatever. Oh, like free calculations? Uh, yeah, yeah. So basically, they're already done a priori when the data are coming in and you're already processing this data and uh, extracting all these values. So data science has uh, the review ID and you can see all, all the features it wants connected to this review, for example. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, thank you. I guess this is kind of going to start by the DevOps question. Then again. So, with MLOps, would you say that MLOps is mostly about processes and a, a process maturity model? Or did you find that there was much of a culture shift they needed to happen as you adopted MLOps? And how did you go about convincing, I guess, the stakeholders, both seniority wise and, and sort of the data scientists, that that was uh, worth the pain? Yeah, you know, I think I think it was more a culture thing. So at the end of the day, the question is, what's MLOps? Um, I don't think nothing really new is is something that we do need to push this model to production easily. MLOps, that's that's how we could do. Um, the need of a culture shift uh, that was definitely something we had to push on. So uh, I think many business may have to. 
uh, convince their senior managers why we should use, uh, for example, such an infrastructure to run our models and be compliant with what we want to do. It depends, obviously, on, on the level of business. If Trustpilot is receiving 4 million reviews a month, we want to be sure user can see any scam, can see any spam, as well as other weird things they could see. And so it makes sense. Then you can rely on something really concrete and something like that. You need a bit of cultural shift because there are a lot of unknowns, obviously, costs involved, a uh, lot of discussions about what to do and not to do. There's no one single answer. So I think you got the point. It's, it's a cultural thing, more or less. It's a cultural MLOps hype. Let's go there. A couple more questions. Yes. I'm rephrasing again the question that came up, I think, twice uh, already, but perhaps it's the same question, but in, in, my own, in my own words. I mean, I think there's a difference between, uh, let's say, deployment for software versus a machine learning model in the sense of I can write software and I can build tests for that software and I can have a workflow that I start it and the test pass and yeah. the change becomes live and everyone's happy. I mean, okay, 99.9% yes, exactly. time and say, but for machine learning, you know, we can define metrics about the success of our model, but a yeah. machine learning model actually working or doing what we think it's doing, it's not quite such a black and white case as it might be with software and, uh, you know, a well-defined test suite. So, I mean, while I think, when you get to the point of saying, okay, I want to now make this model live. Okay, you know, great, that can be fully automated. But to get from, to get to that point, you know, it depends probably a lot on the business case. I mean, how much human, in, how much human manual intervention and manual exploratory testing do you think is needed before you can get from that? Okay, yeah. here's my model idea, right? I'm running it in the staging environment through to, okay, now, now it's, it's deployed in production. Yeah, right. yeah. Can that, Yes. Isn't that the same kind of problem as we solve with data in the non ML world? But like you're doing canary testing to go, if we put this out, we did classify working as you know, we change the behavior of users by this, but we don't know what it's going to be until we can't test it in advance of getting into the life. So we monitor it and then we go, well, we'll try 1%, 10%, or whatever. And then we decide whether we're shoving it out. Yeah, there's. Um, but for me, it feels like the same problem. Yeah, yeah, it's true. I, I think there's a lot of manual work to do. Effort. So there's, uh, yeah, I'm sorry for our data scientists as well as uh, maybe analysts. Uh, they do have to spend time to understand what the model is saying. Um, we do need to provide them with maybe some reference golden standard data sets, for example, sometimes. So... In a data set, you might know how many uh, true and true you might have, right? So you can double check your model in this way. Uh, it's something that should be rigorous um, that you can do sometimes with uh, clear data set and sometimes maybe also with the feedback from your uh, customers. So you could be confident the model is performing well. I give you a kind of A-B testing, for example. So that's that's something that you could even do. So there's a lot of uh, sweat. Yeah. Uh, so any more last questions for anyone? I've actually got one. Got yeah. Left. yeah, let's take the three last questions. And so there'll be plenty of time to do this more open in the pub, in the pub or afterwards, but like, let's take three questions and then we'll, we'll, we'll wrap up. So I think you were first. And then yeah, I'll, I'll take this. Uh, yeah, I actually have a little question which might be like much larger about the data and the data feature store and how to get people to adopt it. But how magic... As, as that platform. So so I guess what I'm asking is, it looks like a cool architectural diagram, not-ish kind of systems diagram. So if I'm a data scientist, am I, have you built a magic platform that I can be like, here's my model in a you know, docker image or whatever it is, and then you could, if it just like five five minutes later, it's deployed. How magic have You're you right. made this? Uh, uh, tons of customization yeah. work. So it's more magic than I thought. No, that's good. <laughs> it's positive. I'm more magic. Know, let's ask my team. I'm always surprised when I wow, what we do? My God. Um, there's no like magic button to press yet. Yeah. There'll be. Oh my God, I wanted to have it. But I think just to give you an idea, uh, before this MLOps thing, to deploy a model, people were taking an average six, nine months. 
It's a huge amount of time. Yeah. Now they're just taking one week, maybe. So, and one week because... Uh, of engineering time or like just pure data scientists? Data scientists. Like, so data scientists, maybe they're spending a bit of time to develop a good vertex AI pipeline, right? Uh, through our SDK, maybe they want some additional features or some ad hoc requests, obviously. One week rather than nine months. Most maybe now they can spend more time to get better models. So to do better exploratory analysis, understand, uh, have solid models as well. And does the data scientist, I promise I'll shut up. Um, <laughs> does the data scientist own it? So what happens if a data scientist leaves the organization? Who looks after the model? Ah, okay. Uh, good point. Uh, no, they, so a uh, structure in a way that there's a uh, knowledge there. Everyone knows what the model is doing, how it should behave. Um, and there's not really a real clear owner of the model. Uh, so, I mean, we, we tend to say as ML engineers, if the model is failing, please check with a scientist and just run a bit of tests. I don't know, some magic, pandas, something. We can do other things. But if there's a pipeline failing, we or, I mean, the entire infrastructure, we're avoiding really uh, bus factors or all these things. So there's a, a good... Uh, now we can leave trust pilot without problems. That's the one to know. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we have, I'm going to limit it to the last two. Like, there's plenty of time to chat up with the yeah, uh, just so we can close up here and then move elsewhere. So I think one question here and then one there. All right. So my question is this. You're, you, you reach this point of where mature or whatever, where the feature is going live after a week or something because it's all quite mature in the data science. Like people think it's ready. And the MLOps people kind of know how to turn this magic ball and make it do its funny <laughs> stuff. And it gets deployed into this it gets somewhere, yeah. context. What sort of uh, mindset do you have, could you have, for when something happens that is a bit more than just drift? You know. North Korea invades South Korea or something. <laughs> the Russians cut the major Amazon cables. Ah. Yeah, you know, something really, really bad And your stack of Python code probably has a little bit of technical debt in it here and there. And you suddenly need to make things change so that they behave in a very different way because the context of the planet is mm -hmm. not gas or whatever. Yeah. Well, I think that at that level, I don't know, I can say, I'll tell you in the pub, uh, what, what's, maybe it's blessing us on a camera, but nice question. Uh, I don't think sometimes we're ready to think of uh, switching. So, for example, what I'm saying is that we could talk about what if the Google has problems and we're losing everything. Present. To do that, I'd say infrastructure as a code. So it seems like another hype. Be ready for this hype. Uh, but it's true. You must have infrastructure written somehow and be ready to. But I have also a real life answer for this, but later on. Another point. No, no, it's not. <laughs> French Python is long, but um, do you think that MLOps will get to a point in the future where full continuous delivery is something that's possible? Because it's something in software world we spend a lot of time trying to get to the point where we can go through continuous from beyond the continuous deployment into full continuous delivery. Is that something that will be possible in ML, or do you think it's just the ML is just not yet mature enough? I think it's possible looking at the recent changes in news as well. And how, so I mean, if you think that now we have models that we can use out of the box and just ping through an API or whatever, um, we'll not be surprised at some point we could have a similar scenario. So, yeah, definitely in a, maybe even a five years' time. I'm very optimistic, maybe. No, I'm not. Yeah, I think that's, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes. Cool. Uh, thank you very much. I just uh, like.